Gamification, a word used to describe basically anything that takes a normal task and turns it into something enjoyable, something rewarding, something addicting. If there's one thing that we cannot resist as humans, it's points. Any type of them. Streaks, combos, leaderboards, timers, anything that shows a score or a way to compete against others or compare yourself against your past self. It's in our nature, and it's that human tendency that companies use to hook you, turning everyday activities into an insatiable quest for points. Okay, maybe I'm projecting just a little bit, but I know that there's enough competitive people out there watching this video that it must ring true for some of you. Everyone has their fix. Maybe for you it's your chess elo or Xbox achievements, but those make sense. They're already games. That's not the kind of gamification that I'm talking about. The gamification that I'm talking about extends outside of the activity itself. Tracking the quality of your sleep, as if looking at your REM cycles is going to somehow magically improve them, logging your bike ride on Strava to show off your miles, and how likely you are to be hit by someone texting and driving. And that driver might have been pumping out a quick Spanish lesson to keep his Duolingo streak alive. Across the board, gamification has been touted as the way to improve user engagement over a long period of time, often referred to as D30 retention, or the percentage of users that were still using the app 30 days after they first opened it. And Duolingo has practically built its reputation on maximizing this metric, optimizing a user experience that's tailor-made to keep you coming back, paying for unlimited hearts and streak freezes, and padding their wallets, all at the cost of you actually learning a language. So let's take a look at Duolingo and explore how gamification tricked us all. Research gamification and you will invariably be pointed back to Duolingo as a gold standard. And that's hard to argue. According to their financial results, this passive-aggressive green owl brought in over half a billion dollars in 2023, and it's expecting to bring in three quarters of a billion dollars in 2024. Duo is also valued at eight and a half billion dollars, one billion ahead of American Airlines, and a billion behind Skechers, just for context. They boast more than 31 million daily active users and close to 100 million monthly active users, of which about 7.5 million are paying subscribers, which adds up to a whole lot of gems. But if you go back just one year, Duolingo was losing money hand over fist, or wing over wing. Compared to Q1 of 2024, where they made $27 million in profit, in Q1 of 2023, they lost $2.6 million. But if there's one thing they've been doubling down in the past several years, it's their gamification strategy. In the words of Duo, learning a language takes time and dedication, and sometimes it can feel overwhelming. We turn to gamification to help our learners develop long-term study habits and make learning fun. And what is a long-term habit besides another word for addiction? I mean, I'm joking. It's not like the app's designed to charge you $12.99 a month in exchange for the rush of acing a vocab quiz, right? To their credit, they've done a number of studies showing a positive correlation between using the app and success in learning a new language. So why then does the tweet that inspired me to make this video feel so innately true when it's completely at odds with peer-reviewed studies? Duolingo is not a business, it's an absurdist art project, an app for learning languages that no one actually learns a language from, like a restaurant full of people waiting for their food that never comes. At its core, this argument isn't really about learning a language, it's about the purpose of gamification for Duolingo. On one side, you can find countless articles, blog posts, and case studies analyzing Duolingo and everything they do, pitching gamification as the way to make your app, service, or crypto rug pull a success. They seem to relish in the fact that gamification is addicting. Success is not millions of students reaching a conversational level of fluency, it's the minutes and hours spent in the app each day, the churn rate, and the conversion of free users to paid users. On the flip side are all the normal people that live in the real world and just want to learn a new language. 
Instead, they get trapped, racking up experience points and gems at the beck and call of a giant green owl. The issue I have with all this is the dissonance between Duolingo's obvious purpose, to make money, and the mission that their CEO puts forward. We created Duolingo in 2011 with a mission to develop the best education in the world and make it universally available. I've always felt that economic inequality is one of the biggest problems facing humanity and education is the best way to help most people around the world improve their lives. Our vision is to create a world where more money can't buy you a better education. But if you're going to build a company whose goal it is to lift people out of poverty by providing education, you better be sure your company is actually doing that. Okay. I can't really just sit here and pretend like Duo doesn't work at all. There are certainly plenty of anecdotes you'll find that using Duolingo has helped people reach their language goals, like this one from a commenter that says they learned the whole Italian language on Duolingo. <clears throat> Duolingo aligns their courses with the Common European Framework of Reference, or CEFR, which is an unbiased way to measure a learner's success. It runs from A1 fluency basically donde esta la biblioteca, to C2, considered mastery, something you might find in a college textbook or a classic novel. In their most popular courses, Duo provides instruction up to level B1 or B2, and in this instance, I think they're right to know their limit. There are obviously different categories when it comes to language proficiency. For example, you may not be able to understand the words that I'm saying, but reading this exact same sentence on the screen might be completely manageable. But of all the categories, the metric people are undoubtedly most interested in is spoken interaction. How well can you converse with another human being using their language? From the official self-assessment document, a B2 level individual can interact with a degree of fluency and spontaneity that makes regular interaction with native speakers quite possible, and can take an active part in discussion in familiar contexts, accounting for and sustaining their views. For most people, this level of fluency would allow them to navigate a foreign country extraordinarily well, at least compared to not knowing any of the language. And for most people, that's more than enough. Honestly, while I was researching for this video, this is where I thought I had hit a dead end. Duolingo provides content that gets users up to level B1 or B2, if they choose. And that's that. What's the problem? Duo has their limits and they know it, but then I was reminded of their self-stated purpose. The free, fun, and effective way to learn a language. You start to realize that, quote, learn a language is intentionally vague. If you were walking around Spain and all you could say is, my favorite color is blue, I wouldn't consider that as having learned the language. There has to be a level you need to cross before you start to even consider a language as learned. Now, because Duolingo courses are supposed to get you to level B1 or B2, and they claim that it's an effective way to learn a language, I'm going to consider mastering the Duo material as the bare minimum. The only problem is, when you start to look into the number of people that actually master a Duolingo course, you quickly discover that Duo doesn't publish those stats anywhere. There are some articles that cite old data from Duo.me, which hosts an unofficial forum for Duolingo users and pulls in data through an API. You'll find an old post that suggests the completion rate for popular courses like Spanish can be as low as 0.007%. A number so low, it would imply that of the 46 million students currently enrolled in the Spanish course, only about 3,000 of them finished it. A claim so extraordinary, you'd be right to be a little skeptical. I'll save you from the boring details, but if you dig in enough, it turns out that the report was pretty flawed. That said, it did lead me to the stats on Duo.me, and what I found there was pretty interesting. Of the 253,504 self-registered Spanish learners on Duo.me, about 18,000 of them have a golden owl for the course, which represents that they've finished every level of the skill tree. However, when you look at how many of those students have a golden tree, meaning that they've maxed out each tier of the skill tree, 
that number drops to 347, roughly 0.14% of the original quarter million registered learners. If you apply that to the 46 million students currently enrolled, it means around 60,000 would have a golden tree. I would argue that this golden tree represents a much more accurate portrayal of completing the course than just getting through each level and earning a golden owl. Learning a language is about repetition, and the golden tree is about as clear an indicator we have that someone put in the reps. I would also argue that because the data on Duomi is based on self-selected individuals, i.e. learners dedicated enough to seek out a Duolingo forum, that those completion rates will only be lower amongst the general population. At this point, I think it's utterly reasonable to ask if Duolingo cares at all about student success, or if they are instead focused on maximizing shareholder value and short-term profits. They do this by hooking learners with a flashy user experience and the false promise of fluency. If you've made it this far, you may be thinking, this sure sounds like a skill issue. It sounds like the rant of someone that just isn't good at learning a language. And maybe my brain isn't wired that way, but I am pretty good at memorizing things. And if there's one other thing that I know I'm good at, it's grinding my way through an obstacle. I was determined to learn Italian with Duolingo. I kept the streak for half a year, I made it all the way through to the Obsidian League, I even paid for Super Duolingo for a few months because running out of hearts was so annoying. And even though hearts recharge rather quickly, it's a pretty clear instance of paying more for better education. Now, before you question my dedication, I even downloaded Skyrim in Italian. I bought the entire duplicate game in Italian. That's not a joke. I have a whole notebook full of phrases about fighting Italian dragons. Hey, tu. Finalmente hai aperto gli occhi. But it was in the midst of all of this that I burned out, realizing a few things. That I was opening the app not to learn or study Italian, but instead to A, check my rank, and B, to keep my streak alive. And the third thing I realized was that if you really want to learn, Playing a game like Skyrim in another language is probably the only tool that you actually need. But I digress. Before I quit, I had found the best lessons to gain points quickly, optimizing every chance to boost me up the leaderboard, saving the best lessons for when there was a double XP opportunity. I even realized that if you started a lesson with the listening and speaking quizzes turned on, and then told the app that you weren't able to listen or speak when the question arrived, you'd be given the credit and the app would just skip to the next question, moving you one step closer to that sweet, sweet XP. I know I'm not alone in this experience. Even if sweating your way all the way to the Obsidian League is not the most common use case, opening the app every day to keep your streak alive is. And as much as we love gaining points, we hate losing them even more. Duolingo knows we love to keep our streaks, like the little point goblins that we are. And while they'll tell you that building a streak is a great way to keep you motivated and learning, it's also conveniently an incredibly effective way to increase your engagement with the app. And they truly have it down to a science, as they will gladly tell you. When your streak is new, seeing it tick up every day from two to three to four days is an exciting reminder that you're building momentum and settling into a habit. Because of this, our team of designers, animators, and engineers strives to make the act of extending your streak feel as satisfying as possible. Incredibly, by introducing more engaging animations on your streak milestones, Duolingo has somehow correlated that to an almost 2% increase in retention of new users. To some of you, 2% might not sound like a lot, but 2% on 100 million monthly users is another 2 million. Even if 5% of those new active users turn into Super Duolingo subscribers, and even if only a quarter of them continue to pay for an entire year, that's $4 million in the owl's pocket just for making a new animation. Of course, you might think I'm simplifying things here, but 
Then again, you probably haven't read their Q1 shareholder letter, or this post from their chief engineering officer that explains the Delight team, a group within Duo tasked with making it more delightful to users, and in turn, improving engagement and reducing churn. It goes without saying, all this optimization has done wonders for their stock value. Since it's low at the start of 2023, Duo stock is up 180%. Sure, not much compared to Nvidia's 750% increase over that same period of time, but come on now, almost tripling in a year and a half is still pretty good. What's interesting is that Duolingo doesn't release any data tying together the length of a streak and the propensity of a user to become a paid subscriber. But I know that there is absolutely data within the company that links streak metrics with customer value. And I have no doubt that the longer your streak, the higher your chance of subscribing is. The other thing we know is that as much as you may think it's Zoomers and Millennials that are addicted to points, it's really the boomers that are running up the scoreboard. According to their own reports, nearly 30% of learners age 60 plus have year-long streaks, while less than 5% of learners 13 to 17 have reached the one-year mark. There is no doubt that this streak metric, among other addicting components of the app, is a major factor why compared to any other language learning app, Duo users are completely and utterly brand loyal. Among its many competitors, often referred to as Mobile Assisted Language Learning Apps, or MAL apps, Duolingo has the lion's share of the market. According to a 2022 study, they control roughly 64% of the industry, outpacing every competitor in a way that makes you even hesitate to call them competitors. And according to other data from Sensor Tower in 2023, if you're a Duolingo user, you're probably a Duolingo user to your core. The likelihood of Duo users opening another language app during the same window of time is around 1%, a shockingly small number for a group of people that you would think are actively trying to find the best way to learn a language. Compare that to one of their competitors, like Babbel, and the story is very, very different. Babbel users are more than 15 times as likely to be getting their language fix with the big green owl while using Babbel at the same time and significantly more likely to also be using any number of other language learning apps. All this means that Duolingo's focus on gamification and maximizing engagement is working. Users stick around longer, they don't leave for another app, and more often than not, they switch to Duo rather than using a competitor. This all paints a pretty rosy picture for Duo, but I think my frustration in all this is not that they've made a valuable app, or even that people enjoy it. There are plenty of worse ways to spend $12.99 a month. I don't even think the app is necessarily bad. In fact, to the contrary, I think the app is too good. Somewhere along the way, I think Duo lost the plot and confused engagement with learning. And confused is a pretty generous term. More than likely, financial success played an instrumental role. Duo has focused less on helping users learn a new language and more on the performance of learning a new language. You log in every day, you keep your streak, you unlock a new level, hey, you may even learn a handful of vocab words, but what I don't believe is that you're actually learning a language. Because the reality is, if Duo really wanted to focus on getting you to learn a language, you wouldn't stick around. You'd either max out the app and move on to more challenging material, or it would be too hard and you'd quit. Because despite what they tell you, repeating vocab words for 20 minutes a day, something Duo considers intense, is not gonna teach you a new language. So where is Duolingo headed, and what does it mean for the future of gamification? There are consequences that extend far outside learning a new language. In their 2024 Q1 financial report, they state that they'll be focusing on four major areas, only one of which revolves around helping users learn, namely their goal of providing higher level content to English learning students. The other three goals are around growing the user base, monetization efforts, and integrating AI. And if that doesn't tell you where their heads are at, I don't know what will. Duolingo Max, one of their newest products, is a higher subscription tier that gives you access to the same benefits of Super Duolingo with two added features. 
One gives you feedback on your answers generated by a chatbot, and the other is called Roleplay, which dovetails into their AI push. It's basically a way to have an open-ended conversation with ChatGPT in another language. But all of this will cost you a crisp $30 in the US, which seems like it's just getting a little bit greedy at this point. Maybe I'm wrong, but it just feels like Duolingo is really squeezing its user base to eke out higher profits. Speaking of profits, earlier this year, Duo announced that they were letting go of 10% of their contractors, choosing to focus on AI content instead. Duo insists that these contractors were allowed to finish up the projects they were working on before transitioning off the team. Now, of all the topics covered in this video, the AI feature is actually one that seems the most interesting to me. Don't get me wrong, I've yet to see a lot of AI applications that aren't straight up theft or otherwise terrible products, but helping you learn a language seems like something that a large language model would be uniquely well suited for. Really, the only issue I have is that they're charging $30 a month for it when I can use ChatGPT for free. Looking forward, I'm expecting that this is where a lot of the apps that we engage with every day are headed. Some are already there, passing off what is essentially basic data analysis as AI in exchange for higher subscription tiers. And you really don't have to look hard to see it cropping up everywhere. Strava announced that it's going to implement the latest technological enhancements in AI and machine learning to transform the athlete experience, whatever that means. Google and Fitbit are going to build a personal health large language model that will give users personalized coaching and actionable insights, and I'm sure they will make you pay for it. Or everyone's favorite, Adobe, who launched generative credits as a way to nickel and dime your use of their AI tools, which, of course, ended up being trained on images generated by Midjourney. It's very clear where all of this is going, but what's not clear is if anyone asked for it. Gamification will only keep getting better at being engaging. AI tools will be rolled out to precisely fine-tune your in-app experience to keep you coming back to rack up points, all while extracting a little bit of your paycheck each month. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go pay chess.com so they can tell me just how brilliant I am. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked that video, feel free to subscribe, um, you know, follow for more, all that kind of stuff. I have been waiting for this moment for legitimately 45 minutes. I've been playing this game and trying to do an outro and win a game at the same time, just waiting for an easy blunder. It has never happened, and this is the first time, so I have to capitalize on this. Like and subscribe, let me know if you want more content, and I will see you next time.